In the weeks before Christmas, the tranquil waters of this Red Sea holiday resort become a predator's killing zone. Shark, shark, get out the water now. Four people are attacked just meters from the beach. It really was like a scene out Jaws. The victims are hideously mutilated. These have to be, without a doubt, some of the most horrible injuries I have ever seen. And four days later, there is another attack. This time, it's fatal. Experts are mystified. Humans are not a normal prey of sharks. Sharks don't like humans. It's, it's, it's really, it's as simple as that. We're not on the menu. We investigate what triggered a shark frenzy that left four tourists maimed and one dead in less than a week. Sharm El Sheikh, a popular holiday destination on the edge of the Red Sea. Up to five million tourists from around the world flock here every year to enjoy the wonders of the coral reef that lines the shore. The waters around Sharm El Sheikh offer some of the best snorkeling and dive sites in the world. A few weeks ago, a British couple, Jim and Joanna Farr, were having a pre-Christmas break snorkeling. We'd been in Sharm for quite a few days. We'd had a bit of relaxation and we wanted a bit of activity and excitement. And uh, we got it, didn't we? Jim and Joe were snorkeling over the coral reef, just a stone's throw from the beach. They swam towards a pontoon used by divers. We were in the water, just swimming along quite casually. And we came across uh, an area which was uh, a diving pontoon. Below us were probably uh, two, three, four divers down there. You could see all the bubbles coming up. It was as clear as you like, you know, wonderful. Uh, fish galore and uh, swimming away and uh, two guys jumped off the pontoon just in front of us. And they swam past me. And as they swam past me, I felt this bang on the back of the foot. Someone had jumped off the pontoon on top of me. You know, this, that was the first thought, but I looked, come up and looked around to the side of me, and the pontoon was 10, 15 foot away. I thought, no, it's, there's, there's nothing, you know, no person that actually hit me. The snorkel guide took his snorkel out and he shouted, shark, shark, get out of the water now. <laughs> We're about 20, 30 metres from the boat and literally just, just had to swim for it to get back, knowing that there was a shark in the water. As Joanna and Jim swim for their lives, the shark targets another swimmer, desperately trying to escape. People were screaming, shouting, they were, whistles were blowing, they were running out of the water, running along the jetty, scrambling on the boats to get in. People were just going wild. It really was like a scene out of Jaws. The victim is a Russian tourist, Yevgeny Trishkin. His arm had been ripped off by the shark. I could see the guy being pulled up onto the pontoon with blood everywhere. No, I mean blood squirting everywhere. I mean, it was like a, it was like a war scene. Marcus Maurer, a local dive instructor, was at the scene and went to his rescue. There was a lot of blood, so the shark stayed there for a while and we started the rescue situation so all the people who have been there uh, have been helping carrying him up we give him oxygen support and we brought him directly to hospital Yevgeny Trishkin was attacked at Rasnasrani Bay at 11 a.m. what no one knew then was that just moments earlier another man Victor Collie had been attacked nearby. He escaped with minor injuries to his leg. Usually we don't see sharks here. We have lots of people during the year swimming, snorkeling, diving on this place, on the whole coast of Sharm El Sheikh. And usually in these places you don't see sharks because sharks are shy animals. 
And what's more shocking is that neither the victims or any of the thousands of tourists in the water that day had any idea that there had been two other shark attacks in Sharm el Sheikh the previous afternoon. The beaches had not been closed and holidaymakers not warned. On Tuesday, there were two attacks. Yet on the Wednesday, we had no indication, did we, that, that there had been any not attacks? Not at all. The first attacks came out of the blue at 2.40 on Tuesday, the 30th of November. Olga Martsinko from Russia and her daughter Elena were on their first ever foreign holiday. A trip to the Red Sea was a dream come true. Кричала и пищала, что я наконец-то увидела этих рыбок, я наконец-то видела все это вживую, а не по телевизору. Вот. Конечно, было очень красиво, великолепно просто. But before long, their dream holiday turned into a real-life horror movie. Я понимала, что хищник живет в море, но никогда не думала о том, что я вообще когда-нибудь с ним встречусь. Six weeks later, Olga is still in hospital, recovering from a savage attack. This is the first time she has spoken of these events on television. On the third day of their trip, Olga and Elena are swimming just meters from the shore. А потом ни с того ни с сего, то есть как бы какое-то было прикосновение к маме, она начала кричать: "Ой, ой, мамочки, мамочки, что это?" И вот этот черный плавник. Я его вижу прямо перед собой, этот черный плавник. Когда меня она схватила за руку, я почувствовала три ряда зубов. Тут уже все, это опять же, как искра, как мгновенно пролетела мысль, что это Притопила ее, вот, и, видимо, оторвала ей руку в этот момент. Она под меня подплывает и схватывает мне ягодицу. И она вот так вот мне ее просто вырывает, вырывает ягодицу. Я начинаю понимать, что меня едят заживо. Я начинаю понимать, что сейчас я просто э, не доплыву до этого понтона. Я сразу поняла, что я сейчас могу умереть. Another tourist took a picture of the shocking aftermath of the attack, showing the extent of Olga's horrific injury. Olga is rushed to hospital, where she is treated by the surgeon on duty, Dr. Mohamed Dhan. I ran to the emergency room, and when I saw the victim, I found their arm is amputated below the elbow. I found the big wound at the back. Uh, it uh, measures about 40 centimeter by 50 centimeter, yes. While doctors fight to save Olga, another Russian tourist is swimming just a few hundred meters from where she had been attacked. Lyudmila Stolyarova and her husband Vladimir are in the resort to celebrate Lyudmila's 70th birthday. Последний день мы, причем супруг даже не хотел идти. Я говорю, ну пойдем, простимся с морем, потому что на следующий день мы должны уезжать были 10 часов. Vladimir had a strange sense of foreboding. Так, ну э, вот э, после обеда на меня какая-то тяжесть навалилась. Прямо я говорю, боже мой, Люся, давай не пойдем никуда. Undeterred, Lyudmila sets off swimming on her own, leaving her husband on the beach. Плавала я минут 10-15, не больше. То есть это было недалеко от берега, в пределах, так сказать, не дальше буйка. 
и недалеко, так сказать, от мостков, на которых я могла подняться. Then she catches sight of something in the water. Вначале решил, что это дайвингер, вот этот кто-то всплывает. Причем она показалась между мною и берегом. То есть мне некуда было деваться. Кругами ходить стало вокруг меня. Ну вот. Ну и в этот момент уже, так сказать, она мне уже стала нападать. Укусила вот эту руку, откусила, и я подняла ее кверху, стала кричать, помогите, аху. Когда меня уже в лодку стали забирать, я увидела, что у меня откушенная и нога. Я поднял глаза, смотрю, боже мой, мою жену несут на, на этом лежаке. А там стоит скорая помощь. Какой ужас. То, что я видел там, как она подняла руку. Ой, я не буду рассказывать это. Ужасы все. Рваные раны. I'm shocked when I heard about the second case exactly after one hour. Uh... She had also amputated arm and amputated leg. Dr. Mohammed has never seen such terrible injuries. At our hospital, we experienced it uh, by about four or five shark attacks in the last 10 years. The injuries was about scratches, was it looks to be bitten by a small shark, not large like that. But uh, this time, uh, it looks to be a large shark. I feel uh, that's a problem in the sea. Shark attacks do occur in the Red Sea, but they're rare. Four such catastrophic attacks in just two days is unprecedented. Olga Martsenko, Tuesday, 2.40 p.m. Lyudmila Stolyarova, Tuesday, 2.55 p.m. Victor Colley, Wednesday, 10.55 a.m. Yevgeny Trishkin, Wednesday, 11 a.m. The extraordinary thing is that all the attacks happen to snorkelers or swimmers close to shore in designated safety areas marked by boys. Я человек здравомыслящий, плавала только в пределах буйка, не больше. Это за два дня я не видела человека, который плавал за буйки. Four attacks in less than 24 hours. The Egyptian authorities finally take action and close the beaches. The red flags are up in Sharm El Sheikh. There's now a ban on water sports. Though some are still brave enough to paddle. The following day, we came down to the beach and they had um, some signs that had been put up only in English that um, said that the beaches had been closed. They didn't indicate why, they just said nobody is to swim in the waters. I saw a couple of people swimming and I saw a family swimming and I just felt sick. I felt absolutely sick. I felt like going out there and dragging them in. We did not go back in the water at all. No. It was a swimming pool not for us all. after that. What shark could be responsible for these attacks? The Egyptian authorities hunt for suspects and set out baits in the sea to catch the culprits. The next day, two sharks are killed and displayed. One is a mako shark and the other an oceanic white tip. The shark was produced for the media as proof of the Egyptian government's assurance that two sharks responsible for the attacks had been caught. But both the mako and the oceanic white tip are unusual suspects, as they live out at sea, in deep, open water, and pose little risk to bathers close to shore. Stranger still, although oceanic white tips are common in the Red Sea, makos are rarely seen. Elka Boyanovsky has been studying sharks in the Red Sea for seven years. I was very surprised that the first shark that they caught was a mackerel shark. 
I've been working in the Red Sea now for, yeah, for seven years and uh, I have never seen a macro shark underwater. So in an area like this, that close to the shore or to the reefs, uh, I was very surprised that this was the first shark that was caught. Usually these are open water sharks. They don't come so close to the reef. Other local dive instructors agree. I can guarantee that in 10 years diving, I didn't see one. And many of my friends, uh, divers, doing a lot of daily diving, they maybe saw it one time or two times in, in the last 20 years. Despite the lack of proof, the authorities declare they have caught the culprit sharks and reopened the beaches. On uh, Saturday, the first day that they reopened the beaches, basically everything was normal. No unusual shark activity. I think no shark activity at all, actually. So everything seemed to be back to normal on that day. The holiday makers of Sharm El Sheikh are once again happily back in the water. Ashley Burchett from Lincoln has heard about the attacks and the sharks caught by the fishermen. After the catch them, felt quite safe to go back in because where the first attacks happened, it was it wasn't near our beach, so we just thought, oh, this happened over there, we'll be okay. But then, the day after the beaches reopen, in the middle garden area south of the resort, dive instructor Ihab Abd El Rahman is diving with students completing their open water qualification when he spots an oceanic white tip shark close to shore. He was very big. I mean big because as usually you can find oceanic between one and a half or two meters back. But I had never seen before oceanic white tip three meters back. The shark didn't give any attention for us. So he has no problem here with divers, but for sure there is something going up on the surface. Ehab swims up to the surface to raise the alarm. We just reached the surface and my hand was to say signal sharks in the water. But I already understand in the first second that already everybody understand because something happened. Unbelievably, another shark attack is taking place only 20 meters from the shore. Ashley Burchett is on the beach. At first, you didn't, you didn't see anything. You just, uh, just saw the woman just shout for help and you thought, oh, she might have cut herself on the coral. Then, all of a sudden, you see like a big tail and then you think, no, she's, she hasn't done that, she's actually been attacked. And then you, you hear her again, and then you see the shark keep coming back for her. Then you see a load of blood in the water. Renata Seifert, a 70-year-old German woman who had been coming on holiday to Sharm El Sheikh for 11 years, was snorkeling in shallow water when she was attacked. She died from her injuries before she reached hospital. The last victim, she came to the hospital, already died. She had amputated right arm and uh, highly amputated right leg uh, and a large wound in the back also. I never seen this injury before. It really hit home when we got home on the Saturday. The news was on that there would have been a fatality. A, a German lady had got killed on the near enough the very same beach that we were swimming off of. Uh, then we realised it was a little bit more serious than just being bumped by a shark. It could have mm. been one of us two. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. Sharm El Sheikh is in crisis. In just six days, one person has died and four others have been hideously injured in a series of horrific shark attacks. In hindsight, the authorities claim that they had caught the culprit sharks after the first attacks is a tragic error. The random killing of sharks really didn't help anybody. You put out baited hooks and then a random shark that might have just entered the area that wasn't even there the day before or two days ago is just grabbing that baited hook and also you could be attracting additional sharks to the area and again, you're not really helping uh, to solve the problem. A culprit shark is still at large. The Egyptian authorities close the beaches again, but they need answers. They pull together a crack team of international investigators. Ralph Collier is a world expert on shark attacks. I have been working uh, in the field of shark-human interactions since 1963. 
This is the first time I have ever seen injuries this severe and this localized as far as the area of the body that was bitten. Eric Ritter is a shark behaviorist specializing in shark-human interaction and recreating shark bite scenarios. My job was to figure out why. Every wound tells a story. And that's, some, that's what all uh, I care about. Can I understand the motivation why something must have happened? And at this stage, the motivation is a mystery. We always hear that the shark like human flesh. Of course, that's not true. Sharks don't like humans. It's, it's, it's really, it's as simple as that. Humans are not a normal prey of sharks. We're a terrestrial animal. We don't live in the ocean. They feed on things that they see and live with every day in the marine environment. So we're not on the menu. But for some reason, five holidaymakers were on the menu. The investigating team have to piece together the events of the past few days. They must try to understand the causes behind the attacks and answer the vital question. What made the sharks attack without any provocation? Why did they go for people bathing in shallow water, just a few meters from shore? And will they attack again? The investigating team began with the two sharks caught after the first attacks. Fishermen went out and caught two sharks, an oceanic white tip, and they caught a short fin mako. Oceanic white tips are one of the most common sharks in the Red Sea. Stocky and powerful, they grow to more than three meters in length. They are known to have attacked shipwreck victims in the open ocean, but in the Red Sea, thousands of divers have swum with them without problems. I have now more than 3,000 dives, and I had never a problem with a shark. This is a really unusual event, what happened there. I think the chance to die by an airplane accident is much bigger than to get involved in a shark attack. Instructors or guiding or whatever divers, they come here, they are actually looking to see the sharks because we love them. And that's really very, very excellent experience for everybody. And normally, oceanic white tips are relaxed, sharing the water with humans. They're very, very self-confident, very, very curious. You have a good chance that they actually really approach you and check who or what you are. You probably could best describe them as being bold. By contrast, short fin mako sharks are rarely seen in the Red Sea. Sleek and strong, they're sometimes called silver bullets. They can also grow to three meters, but unlike the white tips, mako sharks are shy and usually avoid humans. But could the investigators pin the attacks at Sharm el Sheikh on these two species? The evidence lay in the horrific wounds suffered by the victims. Sharks' teeth are like fingerprints. They are identifiable to specific species based upon the shape and the function of the tooth. If we look at the mako shark, what is really uh, obvious is a very pointy, slender teeth, whereas here, in an oceanic white tip, you have a serrated teeth. So when you have a serrated teeth, basically when this animal cuts you, you really have a nice straight cut. Uh, on the other hand, if, if, you, if you have uh, a maker shark and he cuts you, he really slashes through, through the wound. So it's a very uh, ugly type of wound. So just based on that, you could say, okay, this must have been a maker shark or not. Every wound tells a story, and in this case, what these wounds told me, most of the wounds were created by an oceanic white tip, but one person actually was bitten by a mako shark. This was victim number three, Victor Colley. It may also have bitten victim number four, Yevgeny Trishkin, five minutes later at the same location. The other victims had wounds which proved they were attacked by a white tip shark. But identifying the species raised more questions than answers. This isn't how these sharks usually behave. Oceanic white tip and mako sharks are both deep water fish. 
What were they doing so close to shore? The oceanic whitetip shark is an open ocean shark, so it's not normal that they are close to reefs or in shallow water. They might venture in there sometimes, but normally they prefer deep water. Oceanic whitetips and mako sharks hardly ever come close to shore. So if they come close to shore, that must be a very, very powerful trigger. Otherwise, they would not show up that close. In the scramble to explain the shark's behavior, theories abounded in the early days after the attacks. The governor of Shaanxi told the media it might have been due to the dumping of sheep carcasses from cargo ships. We'd heard a story that a Jordanian cargo vessel had come from Australia and was going up to the port of Aqaba and um, had a cargo of sheep on board. It's not uncommon for these vessels to have two or three hundred thousand animals on board. Well, from time to time, an animal's going to die. Their way of getting rid of that is to throw it over the side of the vessel. Just prior to the attacks, there were about 30 or more sheep, dead sheep that were removed from beaches and the waters right off of Sharm el Sheikh. Oceanic white tip sharks have a very widespread interest in different food items, also carcasses of different kinds. The dumping of livestock in the area, if they are really drifting towards the shoreline, uh, could have an influence on the movement and the distribution of a shark like that that is a known scavenger as well. But sheep carcasses alone wouldn't cause such a radical change in the behavior of deepwater sharks. The team looked for other factors which might have brought the sharks into close contact with swimmers. You can see that this is the beach area. Here's one of their jetties or floating docks. And you'll note that the reef, it's very shallow, and then it stair steps down, and then suddenly it drops off from a depth of 20 or 30 meters all the way down to in excess of 800 meters. And it's all very close to the beach. On the beach of Sharm, there's like a, an area which is a flat coral base really, which is about three or four foot deep. And every hotel seems to have a jetty or the diving pontoon that goes out beyond the edge of the flat coral and uh, people were swimming out into the deeper water. You usually find oceanic white tip sharks in water 300 meters deep or more. Because of this stair step effect, it's not uncommon to see oceanic white tip sharks within 30 meters of the beach. So, the unique geography of the seafloor brings deepwater sharks much closer to bathing tourists than any of them might imagine or care to think about. But this alone can't explain the attacks. If it did, they would happen all the time and there would be no tourist industry at Sharm el Sheikh. There must be other factors at work. Next, the team considered the possibility that the tourist industry itself could be part of the problem. Population dynamics are one of the primary factors in shark-human interactions. The fewer the people, the less likely you have of having an encounter with a shark. The more people you have, you increase that probability. Until the 1970s, Sharm el Sheikh was a remote Bedouin fishing village with an empty, unspoiled coastline. Now, it's the most popular resort in Egypt. Sharm el Sheikh gets approximately 5 million visitors a year in an area that is probably only 5 miles in length. All of them are going there for one reason, to use the ocean. And now you have interactions between an animal that is hunting and humans, especially when you look at the numbers of people that utilize this resort area over an, a year. The case was building. Now the team uncovered a new line of investigation. Tourists feeding the small reef fish that live in the shallow waters close to shore. Initially, we arrived at the resort. We walked down the hotel jetty to the end, and there were children feeding the fish. 
they were putting their bread that they've got from breakfast um, in and that's what people want to see, that's what people come to Sham to see, to see the prolific um, sea life and the temptation to put bread in the water so that you get hundreds and a huge shoal is, is great. But how could this apparently innocent activity be dangerous? The fishes come in and they start feeding on this material. The exact actions of feeding fishes is what will attract a shark. They set up low pulsed vibrations which are picked up by the sharks. The fishes now are giving off other scents while they're feeding. The sharks pick that up. So the actual act of feeding the fish is attracting the sharks to the area. The link between feeding fish and attracting sharks is well known, and it's strictly illegal to feed fish at Sharm el Sheikh. There are signs on every jetty yes. as you're walking down, please do not feed the fish. And I think that was in Italian, Russian, German, English. Yeah. This is a nature area, please do not feed the fish. But, you know, kids, they're, they're, oh, look, I can get in the monster fish. And they won't fish. stop. Eric Ritter believes this is one of the most important factors in the case. If we look at these animals, these species that came in, there's only one trigger uh, that makes sense, that is food. Nothing else beside that would actually make sense but food. But could the sharks have been so hungry they risked leaving their deep ocean home to search out humans in the alien environment of shallow water? Then, two key facts came to light. First, the team learned that the temperature of the water around Sharm el Sheikh was several degrees higher than normal for the time of year, and had been for some weeks. But why would this make a difference? Ambient water temperature has a direct effect on the shark's metabolism. The higher the water temperature, the higher the metabolic rate. The higher the metabolic rate, the more food or energy the shark needs in order to sustain its daily life. With elevated sea temperatures, the shark's me metabolic rate increased, which meant the need for food increased, which tends to make them more active in hunting. And at this point, you sometimes get very aggressive behavior from these animals because they're, they want to feed. The second piece of evidence came directly from one of the suspects, the mako shark, caught by fishermen soon after the attacks. This short fin mako shark was not healthy. We know from the autopsy that was performed and photographs that were provided, the liver was very small, it was elongated and narrow. Uh, this animal probably was extremely hungry it was very slim, almost emaciated. Uh, that's uncommon for makos. Their body structure is such that they are a well-built, stocky shark, and this animal was not. The case was coming together. Large numbers of people in an area where deep water sharks could swim close to shore gave the sharks the opportunity to attack. Their motive was probably the search for food. Thin and hungry due to higher sea temperatures and the fact that years of overfishing had depleted the stocks of their natural deep water prey. They were lured into the shallow waters, seeking out the plentiful reef fish being fed by the tourists. But there was still something missing. None of the evidence explained the most horrifying aspect of the five shark attacks. Why the victims were bitten several times in what seemed to be sustained, frenzied assaults. Most of the time, a shark bites a person once. To figure out what we could be, it bites once and then lets go. If a shark bites multiple times, that's rare, very rare. The wounds all seem to be in the same area of the body, the hands, legs, or buttocks. Uh, it's not unusual for a limb to be bitten by a shark because generally that's the easiest thing for the animal to grab when it comes up to investigate the human. However, it's highly unusual that victims would sustain both wounds to the hands and to the buttocks area by the same shark.
Something must have made the sharks change their behavior. The team then looked at whether the sharks could have been influenced by previous encounters with humans. Divers come to the Red Sea to see sharks. Um, so if you are a dive operator that can give your guests this kind of experience, uh, then you have a good chance of actually being successful. So there have been a lot of incidents where dive operators have been illegally feeding or baiting sharks to make the trip uh, more exciting for their guests. So the first idea was really that something has happened here that attracted the sharks and that it was probably human made. Feeding sharks to encourage them to approach dive parties is illegal in the Red Sea. But the team was shown a damning piece of video evidence. A diver feeding fish to an oceanic white tip shark. This footage is still under investigation and can't be shown. But in many oceans, divers feed sharks, and the events Ralph Collier has seen on the video are similar to this legal feeding session filmed in Fiji. They would hold a fish in their hand, and as the shark got very close, they would release the fish, and the shark would chomp down and swim behind them. At that point, the diver would reach behind and pull out another fish from what we refer to as a fanny pack. Over a given length of time, the shark becomes habituated to it, just as your family pet would if you were teaching it to do a trick. This process of feeding sharks, we understand, has been going on there for quite some length of time, more than a year. Ralph Collier believes a shark trained to take fish from a diver may have approached several of the attack victims, thinking they had food. The first reaction a human has, of course, is to fend off something. At that point, the victims extended their hand, so when the shark bit down, it removed the hand, thinking it was a fish. The evidence was not conclusive, but it was the strongest lead available. Now, two questions remained. Had the sharks responsible for the attacks been caught? And what could be done to prevent these tragedies happening again? The team went back to the forensic evidence. Two sharks had been caught, but were they the culprits? In the attack on victim number three, Victor Colley, the case against the Mako shark was very strong. We noted that the upper jaw had some anomalies in it, which told us that it had been injured probably by a large hook in the past. We were able to match up the dentition pattern of that specific shark to the wound that the gentleman received. So we knew that they actually had caught the shark responsible for the attack on that gentleman. But victim number five, Renata Seifert, was attacked three days after the Mako and white tip sharks were caught. Neither of them could be the culprit in her case. And the team couldn't match the tooth patterns of the captured white tip shark to any of the victim's wounds. It had to be innocent. So there was still a killer on the loose. As the team collected more evidence, suspicion fell on a particular female white tip shark seen in the vicinity of several attacks. There is underwater pictures and videos of the shark that is, uh, as we think now, responsible for at least two of the five attacks. She has very distinct markings on her tail mainly. There's a clear indentation in this area, in the leading edge of the upper tail lobe, and that is a very, very rare notch for a shark to have. So this is a shark that is easy to identify from underwater photographs. This notch-finned shark was seen and photographed in the shallow water where the fifth victim, Renata Seifert, was attacked, moments after her death. It was also filmed near Olga Martzinko, victim number one, just before she was attacked. The case against it was stacking up. There were more revelations. The shark seen in the video being fed by the divers had the same notch. It was clearly the same shark. Ralph Collier believes this shark had been trained to expect food from humans. That's why the shark has such very determined behavior around people and, and is looking for something. And when it doesn't receive that, uh, you, there's a high probability that you could be bitten by this shark. 
but there was still something chilling about the extreme nature of the attacks, especially on Renata Seifert. None of these bites looked like a test bite to check if it's something to eat, but it looked more like really this is feeding. She's feeding. She's uh, somehow crossed the line of uh, not identifying people as a food source. It was in a way like the shark really had an agenda. Um, it was not exploration, it was not a defensive wound. This shark really just went after her. This killer shark is still at large. So is it safe to go back in the water? Could attacks like this happen again? If you enter the sea, there's always going to be a minimal risk. It is not a pool. So you have to explain people what the risks are. That's one of the strong points of the Red Sea, a healthy marine ecosystem, a colorful uh, reef structure right off the beach. So that's what people come here to enjoy. But yeah, it comes with a minimal risk that people want to take or not. Ralph Collier takes a harder line. As much as I am against euthanizing any animal, I believe this shark has become habituated to humans. And I believe this shark should be removed from the environment because the potential for it doing this again is very high. The authorities at Sharm El Sheikh have now introduced drastic 50,000 US dollar fines for anyone caught feeding sharks or other fish. But what else can be done to safeguard people's lives along this unique stretch of coastline? Certain behavioral guidelines can definitely help to make encounters with sharks safer. But things like really staying calm, not making any jerky or erratic movements, definitely helps to also keep the shark calm. I don't think anybody is really looking for an option to turn the Red Sea into a shark-free area. Um, there is sharks in the Red Sea still, fortunately for the ecosystem. So if you are coming to the Red Sea as a snorkeler, a swimmer, a diver, um, it is important to be prepared. The peak shark season is over for the year. The sharks have migrated away from the waters off Sharm El Sheikh and won't be here again until the autumn. But when they return, will anyone still want to go back in the water? I don't think uh, I'll be doing any snorkeling again for a little while. I'd like to think that it, it wouldn't stop me, but um, certainly it'd be in the forefront of my mind if I ever went in the water again. Surprisingly, the person with some of the worst injuries has not been put off. Это я тут снова говорю, просто я любитель купаться.